Welcome to the On The Edge Podcast with your host, Scott Groves. Hey, what's up, ladies and gentlemen? It's Scott Groves with the On The Edge Podcast. I'm here with my brand new friend from about seven minutes ago, Ian Morris. But uh, Ian was recommended by a friend who I trust implicitly to um, to basically give me good recommendations and a great human being. Shout out to Brittany. And uh, when she reached out to me, she's like, hey, I've got this friend, Ian, who does uh, you know holistic music, healing. The name of the company is Listening to Smile. And I was like, I, I don't know if this is up my, up my alley, but like... Like, hey, I trust you, and uh, if you think this guy's interesting, I'll interview anybody who's interesting. So then Ian and I started talking, and it got real interesting real fast. We'll talk about you signing um, a couple endorsement deals here, how you're trying to really take the industry back from the music industry, like take the music for the musicians back from the music industry, the conspiracy theory of 440 music speed, which I don't know what that is, but we're going to get into that, um, <laughs> and the fact that you have like this licensing deal where you help out holistic healers, which I think after the last couple years of the craziness with the pharmaceutical industry. There might be some more people looking for more holistic approaches to taking care of their health. Uh, I have no idea about anything about you personally, Ian. So tell me, boyfriend, girlfriend, dog, kids, cat, other businesses, like what did, what did I miss in the 60 second Reader's <laughs> Digest introduction of Ian? <laughs> uh, most of my life has been spent in the performing arts. Um, I play about 25, 26 different instruments. Uh, I'm a visual artist and a poet. I Anything creative, I love doing it. Um, I have found a way to have my passion become my business and still like it, which is really fun. <laughs> and, and super so, rare, right? Usually when people yeah, are like passionate about yeah. carpentry and they get into it, they end up hating everything about carpentry. So kudos to you for right. making that happen. <laughs> Thanks, man. Yeah. And so basically, um, in 2011, 2012, I was diagnosed with MS and colon cancer. I was uh, severely overweight, about 320 pounds at my heaviest. Um, I was going through a dark night at Seoul. I had played uh, sports my whole life, you know, growing up. And um, I had a health condition, a mitral valve prolapse, a heart arrhythmia that I had college scouts and professional scouts looking at me. Uh, most of my high school career, even some of my pony league, you know, younger days um, coming up because I was a pitcher that could throw a fastball but still hit home runs. And uh, so, yeah, but I was running around the bases one game, passed out. And as soon as that happened, all the uh, scouts left. You know, they were just not interested in someone who was broken. So that went into a depression. I went into a dark night of the soul and just had, you know, years of overeating as a, as a crutch, you know, to yeah. self-medicate a lot of drinking and smoking and things like that. But basically I came to a point where my body said no more. Uh, I, you know, ultimately got diagnosed with MS and colon cancer. And then I basically was faced with either I'm going to die uh, or make a change. And so I luckily read the book uh, from Louise Hay, You Can Heal Your Life. And then I read another book in conjunction with that called The Healing Power of Sound by Dr. Mitchell Gaynor. And those books radically changed my life, helped me start down a path of um, holistic healing. And I got into breath work, meditation, and sound healing. Uh, a year later, I had lost over 100 pounds and started my climb out of that depression. And, you know, I attribute that to the binaural beats and frequency music that I got into. It helped me make better decisions about food, uh, ultimately moving my body, getting, you know, somewhat in shape, uh, you know, going through that time period. And, you know, basically people saw the radical transformation and they said, you know, what are you doing? And I said, it's the frequencies, man, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right, like total hippie, so they, like somehow I just yeah. cured everything with the frequencies, dude. Like, and they're like, yeah, all right, bro, how yeah. stoned are you? How are you getting so yeah. stoned and getting skinnier? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it basically totally freaked people out. I remember there was a lot of people asking me, do you still believe in God? Or, you know, like it, it just totally freaked all the people around me. So I lost a lot of my friends and basically had to build a new network of people because I had transitioned and changed so much that um, it ultimately led to me sharing this gift of make the music I started making for myself to heal with friends and family. And they started seeing radical transformations in their sleep patterns, being able to make better choices with food and all of that. And so it ultimately became listening to smile, you know, and it uh, grew into 
uh, over the last five years, we've grown into nine different countries. So, And I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask, how are you managing your MS? Because my grandmother passed from complications with MS, and I know, you know, this is 30 years ago almost, so I know there's been a lot of advancements, but not as many as we would like. Uh, what What's the prognosis there, or how's your, how's your management of that disease? Because I know, you know, I know it can be brutal. Yeah, so basically doctors will tell me that you're going to have to worry about that for the rest of your life. And this is what I've told a lot of people. Um, there are things, if I'm not getting enough sleep or I become stressed, I can definitely see, you know, different, uh, muscle ailments and pains and, you know, uh, clenching of hands and muscles and things like that, like all kinds of like almost autoimmune system type stuff that, that comes with that. But, but basically, uh, as long as I'm, focusing on my self-care i'm getting sleep i'm eating well and i'm doing my meditation and really taking time to pause and have that body like i'm targeting the stress response of the body so if you can get to a place where your body is relaxed and then you have that mindset where you start talking to yourself in a positive way and what i mean by that is a lot of people feel like it's woo woo but it's a if you're familiar with like the master key system I, I absolutely love the master key system it's kind of like think and grow rich but it was put out in 1912 um, and it's a very, very powerful book about finances. It's a very powerful book about manifestation. And it's a very powerful book about mindset. And for me, I loved it so much. I transitioned it into the way that I think about my health. And so I started telling people, like, you literally have to believe that you are a superhero and that you can heal anything that comes, you know, along with your body. And you do that with, you know, taking care of your body, like sleep and nutrition, but you also do that with the way your mindset and the way your internal dialogue is. So instead of saying like, Oh, I hope the MS doesn't come back. I just say like, I am healed. I'm divinely protected. And I just keep speaking this language until my subconscious is like, it's like the go-to when I get squeezed, when something happens, it's like, it comes out automatically that, you know, and it's just something that it's hard to do, especially when you're not feeling well. But it's something that I think if you do it in repetition, you start seeing the benefits immediately. So, you know, thank you for that, by the way. And I know right now there might be some people listening that are like rolling their eyes and they're like, ah, this is too woo woo for me. This is some crazy <laughs> hippie, you know, snake oil salesman. You, you can pick anything, whether it's uh, acupuncture or chiropractics or whatever. And, and you have plenty of people that are believers and plenty of people that are, you know, venomous detractors. Um, but what's interesting, and, and this is where I, I try desperately to keep an open mind, although keeping an open mind is not like my forte. It doesn't come naturally. It's like, I'll yeah. talk to people and they'll say, oh yeah, of course I feel better when I work out. Like, of course, when I'm thinner and I'm carrying less body fat, my sexual drive is higher, which then means I have more sex, which means I sleep better, which then means I wake up more energized and I do more business. And like people see those positive ramifications of eating well or not drinking or working out. But then when you try to go one step further and be like, hey man, through nutrition and self and like, uh, excuse me, nutrition and sleep and, and self care, you can really heal some of these ailments. They're like, oh no, that's crazy. I gotta go to the doctors and get a pill. It's like, well, wait a minute. We yeah. just, we made the first step. Why is the second step so hard? And so I would ask yeah. you as, as somebody that kind of went both directions, right? Like when people are faced with tragedy or hardship or uh, medical issues, some of them go left and eat themselves into oblivion and try to kill themselves, you know, slowly with whether it's cigars or cigarettes or alcohol or self-medication. Some people go right and they pick the path of, hey, I'm going to I'm going to double down on my self-care. I'm going to try to eat healthy. I'm going to try to, like, be the best version of myself, even if there's technically this ailment. You've gone both directions at different times. What was the difference? Was it a mindset? Was it the people around you? Was it what was going on politically? Like, why at one moment did you go left and try to eat yourself to death? And then at another moment, you went right. And you're like, no, I'm going to change my life and heal myself. Like, that that's a rare person that's experienced both, uh, both directions. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that the eating yourself to death is just straight up depression. And I think that it becomes easier and it becomes an addiction, a cycle that is hard to break. And um, Paul Check is a good friend of mine. He's a you know nutrition uh, expert and health expert in a lot of different fields. But one of the things that he says is either you want to do it or you don't want to do it. And he said, you can BS yourself all day. But he's like, ultimately, you have to decide. And and I remember hearing that and just feeling like, yeah, 
that is true. But I think what I want to encourage people is, is that I remember one of my friends is a personal trainer and he said, if you can get up out of bed at 5 a.m. and just show up at the gym and do 10 reps and then go home, you just prove to yourself that you could get out of bed. It was a baby step. Now do the, the next thing tomorrow and do 15 reps of whatever it is. And he said, just that drive there, you've shown yourself that you had dedication to do it two days. Now do it three days. And so, you know, and I remember thinking like, oh, that's so dumb. Like, <laughs> you know, right. But I, but I realized like it's, it's um, even now, like I just started working out on a routine. We're doing three, four days a week now. And it's made changes just in this last three weeks for me where I feel like I have more energy. I feel more excited about the day after I'm done working out because the thing that a lot of people don't realize is it's not just the workout. It's actually changing your brain chemistry, you know? And when you get into like things like breath work where people say, Oh, that's really woo woo. The thing I try to explain to people is when you're consciously taking breath in at a slow rate, you know, like counting to 10 on a breathe in or eight, and then you hold it for a few seconds and then you exhale for, you know, eight or 10 seconds, just very basic, nothing crazy, just slowing down the body. What ends up happening on a scientific level is your heart rate actually lowers. It drops, you know, if you do 10 breaths like that, and then also your brainwave activity, you know, drops into like can drop if with that conscious, you know, in, in tension behind it can drop the brainwave state to like a theta brainwave pattern, which is like what we hit just before REM sleep. So if someone's anxious or has pain or has depression, this is something that could, you know, it doesn't cost any money. It's just the actual 10 minutes, you know, putting into that process. So I think that all these things are really hard for people because we're, the pharmaceutical industry has done such a great job of shoving down our throats you know, there's a pill for every ailment. And they also like to put on the screen the 37 side effects and then give you more pills for the side effects. And I think like one of the things that's really interesting about sound, I'll just make this real quick, is I think the most basic explanation of how this works is we all have a negative friend, you know, the world's out to get them, everything sucks. You know, they're, they're complaining all the time. If you hang out with that friend, for a long period of time, it starts rubbing off on you. That vibrational state now starts coming into you and you start seeing your perception of the world is now changed. But you also have, I mean, most of us have those friends that are just like zippity doo da, zippity day, right? And they're everything sunshine and rainbows. And if you hang out with that person long enough, you feel better. And I think this, this is very uh, basic, uh, you know, uh, you know, depiction of how, vibration can really change you know the words you speak uh to yourself the words that you're listening to from family and friends about you know whatever it is if you're an artist and they're saying oh go get a real job you know these are the people you know it's changing you it's affecting your emotional state so it's like you know that whole thing of the five people that you surround yourself with you become is a very true statement and that is a very vibrational depiction of how vibration works you know whether it's the media we take in the food we eat all of these things have a vibrational state. So as you were talking, I don't know if people can hear me mouth breathing in the background, but I just I just turned on my Apple Watch, which I uh, just got recently because I want to be a little bit more uh, diligent about my fitness. Uh, my average resting heart rate is, let me just look this up so I'm not lying to you, is 67. When I turned on the um, when I turned on the Apple Watch, I I just downed a, a can of caffeine. I'm smoking a cigarette or a cigar. Sorry, I was running around right before we got on the call. My uh, BPM was 78 beats per minute, and just taking those 10 deep breaths, it went down to 71. So I well, mean, it's just like yeah. just think if you can if you can lower your blood pressure by something as simple as like all right, pause, take some proactive deep breaths. Now, in fairness, I wasn't listening to you as deeply as I should have because I was counting to 10 when I was taking my <laughs> breaths. Um, you can change that, right? And there and there's people that just like, oh, I got to drop my my blood pressure down 10 points. I better take like a drug for that, you know, am amlodipine or whatever it is. Like, like there's a lot of things that we can do to care for ourselves that aren't, you know, drugs and stimulants. And, and I'm guilty of all of this, right? Like I've self-medicated with yeah. alcohol before. I love smoking cigars because I love like, that's kind of my forced meditation. I'm on a cholesterol medicine because my cholesterol has been dog shit since I was in my 20s. And there's like every year, there's like some new study on cholesterol that counter contradicts the previous study on cholesterol. Um, so I am by, I have by no means, you know, um, 
uh, solved this equation, but I'm open to having the conversation at least. So how long has your journey been from like when you were at your, your height of, you know, uh, physical, um, uh, unfitness. I don't know if that's even a word, uh, to where yeah. you are now. How long was that like hundred pound journey? How long did it take you to like learn the things and get into a good state? Yeah. So 320 was about 2011, 2012, uh, 2014, I got down to about 180, 185. Uh, and then in 2019, I got diagnosed with diabetes. Um, my father was diabetic and I actually dropped weight down to about 165, um, which wasn't healthy, but I was doing a pretty severe, uh, <laughs> diet where I was basically, I lowered my fat and I, I reversed diabetes without medicine. I basically just used diet and nutrition. It took me a year and a half to reverse diabetes, but, um, I just reversed diabetes and then I started uh, getting into metabolic eating. So basically what I tell people is I don't think there's one way nutritionally to fix, um, across the board, everyone with one diet. And I think that in different cycles and different seasons of our life, we need to eat differently based on what we're doing physically, the kind of stress environments we're in, all of the different things, like when you start doing panels and blood work, the things that you're low and deficient in that you're not getting in your diet, you, you make those changes. And so it's been a big journey for me. And it's definitely been a trial because I haven't gone the mainstream route. And I really believe that this this next five years that we're enter entering into is going to be a very intuitive base where people start taking back their power. Because I think through COVID, we saw that there's a lot of doctors and officials that did not have our best interest at heart. And there was a lot of money that was made during COVID. I mean, everyone from Amazon to the pharmaceutical companies to you know doctors being paid off for you know going you know with the narrative. So. Um, you know, no matter what people believe, I think it's really easy to see whether, you know, the vaccine's right or wrong or whatever. That's not what I'm getting into. I'm getting into it was the most produced medicine of all time in the history of the world and pushed to everyone all over the world. And it's like, how can you not think that there's greed involved in that? You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like there's a, there was a lot there. So I think the, my point is, is not to get too conspiratory, but basically saying, I think it was a wake up call for a lot of people to say like, I need to start taking an interest in myself and learning more about my body and about health and nutrition. Yeah. Well, it's like, I mean, uh, forget about all the conspiracy stuff. Forget about starting a political fight you just look at you you just look at like what the um world health organization you know the the department of health here you just look at like the the comorbidities right so it's like if you died of covid with covid got sick from covid whatever the case may be like being old was the worst thing that you could be all right well we can't really control that and then right below that was obesity and then right below that I, i'm gonna probably screw up the order of some of these things but it was like you know bad um bad metabolic health you know previous heart condition previous lung condition you know so it's like if you were an obese you know a diabetic smoker yeah covid's could very much potentially be a death sentence. And as all this was coming out, I remember somebody, you know, one of the reporters questioning the um, uh, the White House press secretary. And it's like, hey, can we can we at least admit or, or tell the general public that like COVID's not as bad if you're generally metabolically healthy? And they wouldn't even say that. It's like, yeah, cool, get I the know. vaccine, go to your doctors, <laughs> isolate, wear seven masks, spray your groceries down with Lysol. <laughs> like, I'm not gonna hate on you, but the fact that we can't even have an honest, public discussion that it's like if there's me at 200 pounds non-smoker and me at 270 pounds smoker diabetic with like high cholesterol I'm way more likely to die in the latter than the former state of myself and the fact that we couldn't even have that honest conversation is bonkers to me like it just doesn't yeah. make a lick of sense yeah it's it's really wild man and the other thing that's really interesting in my industry is everyone's looking for data, you know, clinical trial data. And I talked to people, I was at an event and this woman came up and she's like, but where's the, cl the clinical data that shows that this works? And I said, why don't you try it 
for yourself and see if it works, right? And she said, well, what do you mean? You don't believe in, in data? And I said, no, most of the data I do not believe in because if you follow the money, for example, there was a, a company that was um, doing some things with a pill, a pharmaceutical pill, and it was new to the market. They brought it to, uh, you know, uh, these clinical trials and they said, oh, you know, 90% of the people who are taking this pill, but then you started looking at how much money they put into the trial. And I asked the woman, I said, if I gave a company $500,000, do you think they're going to go against what I want them to say? Because I just gave them 500 grand. They want me to come back and do more of my pills with them. Right. So, you know, so I said, you know, to get a double blind study and to have something that is really clinically driven for the people is almost unheard of. And so I think like it's really important for people to wake up and start really reading books, doing some research into their health if they really care about getting better and finding people who have been on journeys for 10, 20, 30 years. Like Paul Check has been on his journey for 30 years. I really trust a lot of the things that he's researched and he brings all of the transparency to you when he brings something to the public. And I think these types of people are really amazing at what they do. And I think that they're kind of leaders and follower, uh, the leading this, this following into the holistic, you know, awakening of like, I believe that we're getting into a time of integrative medicine. You know, there are things like surgery and things that are still important and necessary, but a lot of the old paradigm of medicine is dead. You know, I mean, I think we've proven that through these last three or four years that, you know, there's so much that we were lied to about. There's so much that didn't turn out and they're coming back and saying, oh, we were wrong. And, you know, it's, it's just like you were saying, like, the cholesterol medicine. One year we hear the egg is the best thing that you can eat. The next yeah. year it's horrible for you. And you know, same. Yeah. Oh, you mean right? you mean the food pyramid where empty, <laughs> empty carbohydrates that have no traditional values make up the base layer of our our health system because you know in whatever that was the fifties, the sixties, the seventies, Kellogg's wanted to sell a bunch of cereal and whoever made the bread at the time wants to sell a bunch of bread. It's like no empty, like low, uh, high calorie low nutritional value carbs should have never been the foundational of the American diet. And there's a reason why for the first time in human history, we have more people uh, that are obese than we do starving. You know, I, I mean, right. it wasn't that long ago in the eighties that you would see the commercials from, you know, help the children in Africa, help the children in China, that we have such a starving population worldwide. We need to like increase our food production. And a lot of great things have come from mass agriculture. And a lot of problems have been solved by like large corporations that make food. So I'm not completely shitting on them, but I'm just just saying like there's a there's a pretty big piece of evidence that more of the world now is obese versus starving like maybe we overcorrected a little bit yeah 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 it's um and it's definitely you know uh like even with my own diet like when i went you know down to 165 i realized that was not a good weight for me my frame that, that i have so you know even now like i've probably put on another 15 pounds from where i was doing this metabolic eating but it's like my body is readjusting to this new diet and over this next six months i believe you know in getting back in getting into working out again i believe that my body will find its its way but if you like listen to people outside of your own education and knowledge, then you'll say, Oh, you gained weight. You're doing wrong. You shouldn't do this. And I think like, we just have to realize like everybody is so different and we really have to do research and like rely on our internal, you know, we know our bodies if we get in touch with ourselves, right. Right. Uh, we know our bodies better than anyone. And for a doctor to say, well, this is going on and this is going on just from looking at uh, a person that comes in their office without blood work or like proper things because they've been doing it for so long and we take it as it's, you know, God, like, and there's no questioning of it. I think that this is why the, all the stuff has unrolled and unfolded with COVID that way, because there's so many people who have trusted that for so long and just blindly, you know, followed that. And I think that we're basically, I'm just trying to say, we're coming into a time where I believe there is a mass awakening happening where people are starting to wake up and say, I want to make better choices with food. I want to make better choices with my body. And, you know, they want to feel good because I think the isolation really brought a lot of people down. You know, it was like yeah. very hard for people. Yeah, I think and, and this may be our closing thought on this. I think at some point in the future and, and look, I don't want to oversimplify 
people should or should not take this or they should or should not do this or it was it was or was not a tragedy but i think eventually we will find out the lockdowns and the forced medical care and whatnot i think we will eventually find out that the juice was not worth the squeeze you know whether it was the increase in alcoholism drug abuse drug dependency you know kids being out of school for two years uh mental health issues suicides etc 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 i think when we can take a step back in about 10 years and do a non-political you know like you said the double blind study we can do a real survey of the scene without it affecting the upcoming election i i think it'll become pretty apparent that the juice was not worth the squeeze on how we we uh we handled this so uh that was not supposed to be the crux of our conversation but i think it's an <laughs> i think it's an interesting background to you know this has clearly informed your your choice to go into holistic music and healing music and again kind of like kind of like you're fighting the system on the health and the pharmaceutical side kind of fighting the system on the music side so first you kind of glossed over the fact that you play 25 musical instruments and unless you're specifically prince i just don't feel like that's possible so <laughs> give, give us a rundown of how one man unless you're like on the spectrum and you can just sit there and teach yourself stuff full time how does one man learn 25 instruments because i struggled with the bass yeah. Yeah. Well, I was really lucky. My dad was a musician, so I grew up with music instruments and a lot of really amazing music around me. So I remember growing up listening to like the Beatles and Miles Davis, John Coltrane, Tower of Power, you know, John Prine, James Taylor, just tons of music like that. And then I started getting into the 80s and 90s music as I was growing up and just really lived a very diverse uh, exposure to music in that household. And um, you know, he played violin, piano, bass drums, guitar, keyboards, saxophone, flute. So all these things were <clears throat> in the house. And I started off playing bass. And, I, and the very first bands I played in were punk rock. And my dad's like, come on, you know, punk rock, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're like, I taught you more than three chords, you know? Like, <laughs> yes, yeah. like Green, Green Day has like seven albums where they're playing the three, <laughs> the same three chords in like just different arrangements. I'm like, come on, bro. Can, can, you, can yeah. you branch out a little bit? Yeah, yeah. So I... I grew up playing in punk rock and metal bands. And then I started getting into like cover bands because you could make more money that way. And it was just something that was fun because it challenged me to learn other people's songs in that way. And then I started playing with a uh, kind of classical fusion. Like I, I started playing the Yuchen. It's a Chinese instrument uh, from the lute family and started playing with a band like cello, violin and all kinds of, you know, uh, interesting things, melodica and, all, you know, all kinds of crazy instruments. But it really taught me to become a better musician playing with them. And then I ended up working at Interlochen. It's a performing arts school in Michigan. It's a uh, classical music and jazz conservatory there. Um, and I just was exposed to a lot of amazing musicians from all over the world. And I started just playing all kinds of music. I got into trip hop and hip hop and, you know, pop music and just learned how to start making beats and doing my own recording. So about 15 years ago, I got into Logic Pro and doing home recording. And then, you know, because there wasn't a lot of musicians around where I was living, I just started learning the instruments as a necessity so I could just start recording all the parts myself and making music by myself. And that's kind of... Do you play upright bass? A little bit. I'm okay. not, not as much. I love cello, violin, hammer dulcimer, um, you know, the hand pans, hand drums, flutes, um, all kinds of stuff, man. Just I, I, the you know the didgeridoo, the sitar, a lot of really interesting instruments. <laughs> Dude, the didgeridoo is the best sound. Like right at this moment, I'm gonna have Chris insert for people don't know, know what a didgeridoo is. At this moment yeah. in the podcast, I'm gonna have Chris insert like some dude doing a didgeridoo, didger, didgeridoo, because that is the wildest instrument I think I've ever seen. Yeah, it's very cool. And it's so natural, you know, it's just such a minimal instrument, but it has such a unique sound, you know? Amazing. Um, so yeah. tell, you said it was uh, the software you started using, Logic what? Logic Pro. Logic yeah, Pro. Logic. So you started just recording your own beats and your own music. And then how, yeah. does, how does this move from your punk rock metal, you know, uh, uh, roots to like, I'm going to yeah. do holistic healing music for massage therapists and chiropractors. <laughs> Before I got sick, one of my friends introduced me. He's like, Hey man, I know you've been struggling. He's like, here's a CD. It was Alan Watts. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but Alan Watts is a genius guru of the spiritual, 
uh, world. And anything that he says is gold, pretty much in my opinion. He's just so deep and really makes you look at the world differently. Um, very powerful. You can look out on YouTube and type in Alan Watts. Tons of musicians are putting his, you know, lectures to music and they're just really powerful. So yeah, that was literally the start. Um, I started getting into lots of spiritual books and going down that path, but right before I got diagnosed with MS and colon cancer and I was already a musician and I started getting into my spiritual awakening, you know, so to speak. And then basically it was just kind of like a no brainer because I had used it to heal myself. So a lot of like yoga studios and friends that I had that were doing holistic stuff were like, Hey man, like, you know, could you bring the music and like, let's host an event at the yoga studio. And it just, I I never had the intention of doing this business. It just kind of, you know, God, the universe, whatever, just pushed it in there. And I was like, well, I guess this is what I'm doing. You know, it just, it took off and, um, you know, it, it just, that, I guess, like they say, the rest is history. (laughs) That's amazing, man. Um, there's a guy, oh, he has a, he has like a, he's a white guy, but he sings like, kind of like, um, what I would consider like Indian yoga music. You're going to know who this dude is. And he's done a couple like 80 songs. Like I want to know what love is. Um, but he's done it to like this really long, oh, what is his name? It's like, uh, he goes like chakra dupra or something like that. Uh, it's gonna drive me nuts. I'm gonna I'm gonna look this up. I'm gonna find it by the time we're done because he's got like this 13 minute. It's like mm, uh, and then it, it goes and it goes and it's really slow and it's like this meditation music and then all of a sudden at the end he's like. I want to know what love is, and I'm like, oh, this is so good. You got me. Um, I know, I know, who, I know who it is. It's it's uh, Krishna Das. Krishna that Das. It? That's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. man, he's awesome. so good. I'm gonna. Um, yeah, so good. All right, so good. I, I'm going to. Uh, yes, beautiful song, Krishna. K R I S H N A D A S. You got to put another link to that, Chris, in the music because that song, Krishna Das, where he's like, uh, I, I want to know what love is. At the end, when it hits, you're just like. Oh my God, I was just listening yeah. to this like super <laughs> felt like an authentic yoga song. I was all stretching because I was in a yoga session one time. Yes, I've done hot yoga many times for those that are listening that are like, wait, aren't you like a boxing weirdo jujitsu guy? I love hot yoga. I was doing it and I was like 15 minutes into the stretch and I'm feeling good. And then I'm all of a sudden I'm like, this song sounds really familiar, but I've never, I couldn't, I couldn't like, like name a yoga song. And then all of a sudden he's like, I want to know what love is. I was like, Oh, I want you to show me. I got it. Um, anyway, I was, I was very, I'm very excited by Krishna Das. Yeah. And, and there's one more guy I'll give you MC Yogi. MC Yogi. MC Yogi. Oh man. I'm bringing it up on YouTube right now so we can link to this guy too. Yeah. He's awesome. He's got some really cool, cool music. Um, for sure. All right. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna be playing. I play music. I I also grew up in a family of music, but not musicians. Just yeah. ev- everywhere we went, whether it's a commute or a road trip or at home, there was always music on. Like I can't remember being. Do you remember those uh, time? How old are you? Out of curiosity. I'm 45. Okay, cool. So we're the same age. Uh, do you yeah. remember when we were kids, like our grandmothers getting like those Time Life cassette tapes, and it was like yes. the best of the 50s, the best <laughs> of the 60s, and it was like yeah. it was like it was like what we would easily do, just put on like a mix play right now on YouTube. But at the time, you know, you had to order it for 59.99 from Time Life Music, <laughs> and I remember those always being on at my grandma's house, and then we always seemed to live far away from where I went to school, so we had like a 25 minute commute. Like some of my most precious memories from my childhood with my father is driving from Glendale to Pacoima just like rocking out to Creedence Clearwater Revival and Led Zeppelin and we would just do this game like if I couldn't name the band he would just like hit me in the arm and I mean <laughs> thank thank God child services wasn't like a thing back then because they'd be like dude Scott why is your left arm always habitually bruised it's like well I, I get a little I get a little love tap if I don't know that this is you know Guns and Roses versus uh, Led Zeppelin and uh, so yeah. I love music but I have zero talent to play it maybe if I win the lotto I'll learn how to play the bass for real one day i think i could play like one pink floyd song but um it, it's fascinating anyway so so you you fall in love with like this kind of holistic healing you've got some friends that own yoga studios that are like doing this and then where do you decide to make this into a business where all of a sudden you're like no no i'm gonna open listening to smile we're gonna create a a, a platform that helps take the power back and give it to the musicians so maybe you can describe how that happens and then what is your platform listening to music actually do or sorry listening to yeah. smile actually do yeah, listening to smile. yeah yeah so basically um 
I started seeing all of my musician friends. I was getting a lot of calls late at night from musician friends, and they're like, "Man, I'm I'm giving up on music. I'm retiring. I'm gonna go get a real job." And I started watching all of my friends just fade away, and just over the next couple of years, I just watched them become in deep depressions, drinking more, you know, and kind of unplugging from society and their friends to where you had to like check on them, call them and like say, Hey buddy, are you doing all right? And like, I think when you watch people give up on their dreams and their mission in life, like why they're here, you see that quite a bit. And I think there's even a lot of people who can't figure out what their mission is. that are in the same type of, you know, depression. And so, um, I didn't want to see myself get to that point and um, so much so that I was willing to do anything that it took. And so I started really thinking like YouTube and Spotify have no, you know, they don't have my best interests in mind. Um, The, you know, I looked at Spotify, Spotify, you know, this was about three years ago. The average employee at Spotify was making $110,000, not upper management, not management. This was average employee, 110 grand. But they're telling artists that they built the platform on the backs of those artists saying, we don't have money to pay you. But they're paying all of their employees 110 grand a year to run a platform that they would not have without the artists. So I started saying, something's not right here. And I started saying, what if I did something completely different? What would that look like? And and just for context, like if you're trying to make it as a musician and you don't have a four record deal, you know, I, I remember reading uh, Jerry Cantrell in like Guitar World when I was a kid wrote this article about how, you know, he and the rest of the guys in Alice in Chains literally did not see a penny until like their third or fourth album came out because everything was in advance and then the music industry screwed them and you know now even though he's made some horrifically anti-semitic comments uh i think there is a layer of truth in what kanye is complaining about about you know african americans getting abused in the music industry i I don't think he needed to blame it on the jews which is like a bridge too far for 99 percent of americans thank god um but like the music industry does chew you up and spit you out so then the idea was like well between putting a tip jar and maybe playing small venues and spotify and YouTube, I could eke out a living as a unsigned musician, but you were giving me some stats on what it takes on, you know, Spotify to make money. Can you run those down on like what it actually takes to make money as a struggling musician on any of these streaming services? Yeah. So just to, you know, be clear sometime in the last three or four months, I think Spotify lost a court battle. So I think there's going to be some changes, but I don't think it's very much, you know, like it's not a big change, <laughs> but, right. but basically, yeah, three years ago, you had to make a million streams to make 3000 us dollars as an artist. And the thing that I try to tell people is like, let's say that the industry is saying, Hey, come put all your stuff on Spotify. It'll help get you, you know, noticed and people will become aware of your music. Most of the people that put their, you know, by the way, 40,000 songs a day are being released on Spotify. So think about that mess that you have to fight through to get people to hear your music, number one. Number two, uh, you know, most artists will never see a million streams in their lifetime. They don't have the PR campaign behind them to get those types of streams. Right. So you're putting your entire catalog out there for people to listen to for free, basically. You might at the end of the year get like a $500 check or a $200 check. But imagine like um, three years ago, we just pulled most of our catalog off of Spotify. We had four albums on there just for like a... Uh, uh, you know, awareness of like what our music was and, and what it what you know, what it sounded like. So we just took it down to one. There's only one album on Spotify that has, you know, our music there. But uh, two years ago, we had it was over 270,000 streams. And, you know, it's just like if I, if I would have had 99 cent downloads or, you know, people buying our albums, you know, that would have been a, a life changing year for an artist, you know, that's, right. you know, developing. Um, and so, yeah, so it's just, it's really, really challenging for people to, because you sign these contracts where now the record labels are not coming after streaming because they're not making it. So now they're coming after your merch, your t-shirt, your CD sales, your digital download sales. So literally artists are not making money in streaming. They're not making money at the concerts. You know, even a lot of the new deals are taking ticket prices from the artists, you know, when they're performing. And so it's just, 
it's very, very frustrating. And, and I'll just tell you, uh, you know, one more thing uh, while I'm on the soapbox is the self-publishing industry, right? right. For, for me, there's a lot of people that believe in the self-publishing industry. And I think that there are entrepreneurs that are trying to make that better. But the big giants that are pushing that self-publishing are feeding on the dreams of a lot of people, uh, you know, and, and promising them a lot of things to come and that never are delivered. And so, we were approached by a publishing company that wanted us to put 25 grand into a book and wanted to um, us to do a lot of other things in the promotion of the book. And so I said, well, what, what skin do you have in that game? You know, please tell me. And I said, if you, for me, in my opinion, this is, you know, people can feel differently and it's totally fine. But in my opinion, the reason why record labels and publishing houses are there is because they're finding talent that no one else can find. And then they're bringing that talent to the public and saying, we believe in this person so much, we're investing money and believe that this will have a return for our company. But now that's not the case. It's like they're taking 50 artists, 100 artists, authors, and they're saying, pushing them all out in the world and saying, I hope one of these hits and the other people, you know, we'll give them hopes and dreams, but we'll just throw them away when they don't work out. And they never really... They try one song. If it doesn't hit, they throw them away. And it's like, can you imagine if that happened with like Johnny Cash, Bob Dylan, yeah. Bob Marley? You know what I'm saying? There's no artist development going on in the author industry or the music industry. So it's like, and I'm not saying that's like, I know there's entrepreneurs that are coming up and trying to make self-publishing a very viable thing and doing cool stuff with it. But I'm saying the, the big giants, right. you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's very, very hard. So my point is, is that I just believe the new paradigm is people investing in themselves, building their own publishing house, their own rights to their music and owning it 100% and creating their own distribution system. So I, it is a lot more work, but I think that when you look at, you're still getting to do what you love. You're pushing out the music where you want it to go. No one's telling you, you have to do things that you don't want to do. And it's just such a better life. And I believe that the new marketplace is going to be conducive for people, you know, moving in that direction, that new paradigm. You know, it's interesting Two two thoughts there, because one, I, I can't speak at all to the recording industry, but I can talk to self-publishing books because I self-published through Amazon where it's like, it's this double-edged sword of like, yeah, I, I was an unknown writer. I don't have a huge audience. I was never going to get picked up by a publisher to publish my book, um, lead generate 61 days to double your pay shameless promotion of my book. Um, so <laughs> I'm, I'm, awesome. I'm glad that Amazon was there. However, there's like some little dirty tricks where like if I sell my book for $15 and Chris can double check me on this, he knows the math probably better than I am. It's like they take their 40% royalty. Okay, cool. That that makes sense. And then they charge me $4 for the printing and, and shipping of the book. But I think anybody like thinking about it would be like, all right, you sell it for $15. They take $4 off the top for printing and shipping. And then they take 40% of the $11 that's left over. Oh, no, no. They take 40% of the whole cost, which is the $15, which is what a publisher or somebody would take. And then they take the $4. So, you know, when it's all said and done, I get like three bucks a book or something like that, which is fine because nobody gets rich publishing books unless you're one of like 20 authors. But it's like, there's just so many little dirty tricks. And I'm just like a nobody on the self-publishing book. I can only imagine if you're trying to make it in the music industry or with a publisher in the author uh, industry, like you're just hosed, man. You're like, you're behind the eight ball from day one. <clears throat> like it's just brutal. Do you remember the guy that wrote chicken noodle soup for the soul? Yeah. 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 Okay. So what I think is interesting is when you look at these guys, even, um, uh, uh, Neil Donald Walsh, uh, who wrote conversations with God, right? These guys both got fronts. They got advances on their, you know, they, they, yes, they sold books out of their trunk. They, they, they slang, you know, they got out there and they pushed, but when they got picked up, they got cash advance deals, you know, that they were put into. And you look at those guys, the, the Campbell's, uh, I mean, the, uh, chicken noodle soup for the soul guy basically made a book empire over a hundred million dollars because they believed in him and said, this is a great story. And they pushed it out. And this is the kind of stuff I'm talking about is like, there are amazing people out there with amazing stories that would be able to take, you know, the JK Rowling, right? The, the books that really grab people and pull them in. These are things that people have invested money in because they believed in it. And that means they have skin in the game. So they have to push it. 
So you have someone on your side pushing that out to the world where it's not just you trying to start, you know, start the wheel from scratch, building a, an audience with a book that, you know, nobody has heard of at that point. Right. And it's a lot of work to bring these albums, these pieces of art, these books to market. And I just believe that what I told the self-publisher, I said, what, you know, when they were approaching me, I said, basically what you're telling me is that you have lost the ability to contain any, you know, uh, foothold in the market. So you're feeding off of the bottom people that are, that are, have nowhere to go. And then you're accentuating all of your connections with the dinosaurs who in five years are going to be gone, the Deepak Chopras and, you know, all of these people that they're, they're on their way out and you're not investing in the junior varsity at all. Where do you think your market is going to be in the next 10 years? You know what I'm saying? So it's like, I'm just basically, um, really wanting people as far as the creatives to realize like we run the show all of the propaganda all of the things that are pushed out to like create pr campaigns are from graphic artists they're from videographers they're from the, all of the creative people imagine if creative people took their power back and said we're going to work and create our own you know publishing house for artists for artists by artists and create things and there's th those movements are starting to happen now and i think yeah. it's really important you know well it's it's funny i i feel like almost what you're speaking to is a bigger societal problem and i've mentioned this so many times one day i'm going to write a book called the amazon generation about how we're all just like we've all been preconditioned now to like, I want it now, click a button, get what I want, yada, yada, yada. You know, one of my favorite stats is John Wooden, who's uh, arguably the best basketball coach of all time. Well, prob probably now passed by Coach K at Duke. Uh, you know, uh, Coach Wooden at UCLA is famous for 10 of the last 12 years that he coached at UCLA, he won 12 NCAA national titles, right? It's like, it's probably never gonna be uh, repeated. But what people don't know is UCLA employed him as their basketball coach for 15 years without him winning a national title. And he had a lot of losing seasons where, well, not a lot, but a few uh, losing seasons. And then a lot of middling seasons where they were 19 and 10, 19 and 12, 24 and seven. And like UCLA stuck by him for 15 years before he hit this streak of like, oh, 10 out of 12 years, they won a national championship and probably the greatest college basketball dynasty of all time. And it's just crazy because there's there to your point of like, where is the big boy publishing house or music industry or representation of creative people? They're like, hey, you know, let us invest in these people that are going to have a couple duds, a couple albums that aren't hits, but we'll get there eventually. That's just not the society we live in right now. Like I, no, you'll, you'll no, never yeah. see a college football coach where they're like, we're going to stand by you for 10 years before you win a national <laughs> title. It's like if you're at Arkansas or Alabama or LSU and you're not like in the hunt in like two seasons, you're done. You're out. They're firing yeah. you. So like th yeah. there, there will probably yeah. be another wooden ever again because society just doesn't have that patience. And I don't know. It's just one of my soapboxes. So I apologize. No, no, I love it. It's to it's totally true. And I think that we're, we are losing such the voice of generations right now. People, you know, like all of these influential people that changed the world, like John Lennon and all of these people that put out messages and really created music that socially and radically changed the world as we know it. Um, you know, the Dixie Chicks spoke out against George W and were blacklisted off the face of the planet. Like they were never the same after that. And I think like, it's really challenging for me because I believe that artists, poets, musicians, architects, fashion designers, all of these people are shaping the world and perspectives of life through art. And I think the whole purpose of art is to challenge the system and challenge perspective on what life is. And we have lost such, so many voices um, from generations that we will never, music and art will never be the same. Hopefully I'll eat my words and someone will come up. And, you know, I remember when Nirvana knocked Michael Jackson off the Billboard Top 100, right? right. And I was like, wow, this is the kind of, you know, because it was so radically different at that time. And I feel like we, we need some kind of new movement that is not trying to become millionaires off of the music, but it's heart. It's coming from heart and connecting with people so that it radically can create this change. And I'm, I'm hoping to be a part of that in my own way, you know, with the company that I'm doing and what we're trying to do with music and what the way we're engaging people to basically have self-awakenings and 
to go through a transformation process and realizing that they are a god in their own right. And what I mean by that is we have this trillions of cells that we're walking around in and they're listening to every voice that we talk to ourselves, every every person, the way we allow them to treat us, these cells are listening. So this is a universe that you're walking around in and it's like your voice is in control of what takes place in this body. And I think that it's just so critical that people... Um, you know, can get to a space where they start believing in themselves and uplifting each other um, so that we can have these this change that needs to take place. So so tell us how your company is on a mission to fix that, right? So we talked a little bit when we first started that, um, you know, your goal, you've got about 700 albums in your discography at Listening to Smile. You know, you, you're obviously currently serving the um, the kind of holistic healing space, the yoga, the, you know, the hippie gyms. I'll just say it that way. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, and but you have a, a much bigger mission than this. So can you talk about how your company is structured and what you're doing to change that paradigm in the music industry? Yeah. So basically we own all of our music a hundred percent. We're not using a record label or publishers. We have, you know, um, copyrighted our catalog as a private catalog. And then we license that privately to the individuals and companies that we're working with. Um, and so we're really in that holistic practitioner market, but we have just recently signed cliff bar. Congratulations. Into, yeah, that's a, that's you. a big, that's and, a, that's a big boy contract, man. Congratulations. Yeah. Thanks. And, you know, Cliff Bar just got bought out by Mandalese and uh, Mandalese is a uh, is owned by Kraft, five billion dollar buyout. So it's pretty amazing for them. So uh, but yeah, so we um, started working with their employees, just helping them to relieve stress and anxiety and then working on pro productivity and focus and tra basically trying to create um, music and a company culture that is centered around joy positivity and productivity, but also helping to alleviate stress and, and anxiety in the workplace, you know, that can take place from being under pressure with deadlines and all of that. And so, you know, we're having really positive effects with their employees. We've got a lot of really amazing testimonials. Um, and so there's a lot of other companies that are starting to open up now. And it's, it's companies that you wouldn't think would be a part of this movement. But I think, again, it comes back to COVID happening and companies realizing like we need to focus on our employees' mental health and well-being, you know? So uh, for us, that's the big movement in this 2023, 2024 is we're getting into a lot of products where we're infusing products with frequency and using our, uh, you know, codes on the packaging where people can listen to the music that the food and different products were infused with. And we are moving into workplace wellness and then working with all of the individual clients that the holistic practitioners have um, with you know their communities that they've built but the biggest thing that i'm proud of is we have a thing that we call gratitude payments so anytime it's not a multi-level marketing scheme it's literally like if you choose to talk about our company and someone signs up from you doing that we give you a kickback it might be a hundred bucks or it might be 12 percent of a cell that was 50 grand, you know? So it's like, basically we want to create a synergistic exchange between people who are taking the time to not only use our product and to see the benefits, but speaking it and then sharing it with other people in their community. And we want to make sure that they, uh, you know, their time is considered uh, in that exchange. And we want them to make money because we want them to sign up next year and support the work that we're doing. So I, I want to give you two case studies so that I understand this and hopefully the audience can understand this. Let's say I'm a, I'm an as, aspiring Krishna Dawes, right? I, and I want to do music for uh, meditation and what have you. And I'm like, Hey, I, I've got my, I've got my mixer over here and I've got, you know, a couple hours worth of music that I think would plug in super well to the yoga community or the meditation community or whatnot. Or my buddy, I got to introduce you to my buddy, brother James. Um, he does, uh, like inspirational tracks and music of gratitude and stuff like that. Um, come to think of it, we got to get brother James on the podcast and I got to introduce you to him. Um, anyhow, okay. Um, so, so, you know, I'm brother James or I'm like this aspiring Krishna Dodd and I come to you and I'm like, Hey man, I don't want to sell out to the record label. I don't want to just put all my stuff for free up on YouTube or Spotify. Cause this is like, this is my baby. This is my creation. I've worked really hard on it. I think there should be a return on investment. I'm a creator. I come to you. What do we do or what kind of relationship do we enter into? 
So this next year in 2023, we're going to start teaching musicians how to record in sacred frequency. So basically, like we're, we're not working in standard tune music. We're working in 444, 432. Um, these are different frequencies that have shown clinically, you know, there's like 111 hertz and also like 174 hertz from the solfagio scale that. Dude, you just talked been... right, right over my head. You got to <laughs> You got to explain some of this okay. stuff. So like, OK, okay. okay. So, so pretend like I'm pretend like I'm my six year old son, Gabriel. And you got to explain okay. to me why what you're doing with music is what what is better than what the music industry does, because that was okay. that my eyes yeah, yeah. glazed over when you said hurts. Yeah, yeah. So hertz just means vibrations per second. So like it, when you pluck a guitar string, it starts moving. There is a vibrations per second that takes place. And so the hertz is just a measurement of those vibrations. Okay. So, yeah. So um, 528 hertz, they dub the frequency of love. Right. And so what they have shown is that like the grass in the springtime, when it starts sprouting up, it's that yellowish greenish color that that frequency and the light spectrum and, and the sound spectrum are very similar, very close to, you know, the same vibration there. Um, the 528 Hertz is just super powerful in my opinion, when people are having issues with like loving themselves and relationships, you know, even the heart chakra, you start playing these frequencies and you see it. Like I remember we were at an ecstatic dance concert and, uh, they were playing my music and this guy was dancing and he comes over to me and he's like, Hey man, this is, this is the heart chakra. And I started laughing and I was like, it is the heart chakra. And he's like, I can feel it. (laughs) So it's like, it's just like, there's a lot of times when, even when you play these frequencies that go with different chakra systems or organs in the body, like we even use organ frequencies from the body, like the liver, someone that had a parasite, we did a liver and a large intestines frequency to help the body find alignment with that healthy vibration. There's no way this works, right? Like, I just got to say, there's no (laughs) way this works. You're not, you're not curing liver ailments through like frequencies of music are you like is this real science or is this bullshit yes. no this is real so there, there so there is a guy you can look him up his name is royal raymond rife and the rife machine was something you know you're talking late 30s early 40s uh who basically started studying light and sound frequencies and he was looking at bacteria and viruses under a, a microscope And so he started using a color, you know, a light colored light and doing these different spectrums of light with it. And when he came across this one spectrum on this virus, it lit the whole virus up. So he's like, this is the light frequency for this virus. So if there is a light frequency, there has to be a sound frequency. So the research he did was he started finding the frequencies. And when he would hit the resonant frequency of the virus or the bacteria, the cellular membrane would burst, it would pop and it would just ooze out and it would die. And, but it wouldn't damage any of the other tissues in the body because it was just for that virus or just for that bacteria. And so he said, hey, there's something here. And he started working with cancer patients. He started working with people that had viruses. He even had a, vi- a frequency for COVID, which is really interesting, right? So anyways, my point is, is that he studied hundreds, if not thousands of different issues targeting with sound and light frequencies. And he started having such huge effects that the equivalency of what the FDA is now came in and shut him down. You know, that wasn't like really totally formed at that time, but that government agency came in, confiscated all his machines. I think they even put him in jail. You have, you have, you have to do Who, Who's the guy again? We're going to, we're going to Google this when we get off the yeah, phone. Yeah. 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 Royal Raymond Rice. Royal R-I-F-E. Raymond Rice. Okay. Rife, Rife, R-I-F-E. R-I-F-E. I'm going to look it up. And, okay, yeah. so here's the funny thing. Like, I hear what you just said, and again, I told you I was going to come to this podcast with an open mind, <laughs> and it sounds like crazy bullshit pseudoscience to me, but in my I pocket, in my pocket is basically a, a uh, compressed melted sand that somehow goes into a microchip that somehow conducts electricity that somehow talks to the air and the air somehow talks to a tower and that tower somehow talks to a satellite so it's like i i don't like my brain is not squaring this where i'm like i un, i kind of understand how this piece of 
miraculous science works. And it's through all the same, you know, light spectrum and air spectrum and radio waves. And it's it's through all the same shit you're explaining. But it's like, I physically have this in my hand and I can understand, oh yeah, well clearly an iPhone works because they melt some sand and they turn that into wafers <laughs> that turns into chips and those chips conduct stuff and it memorizes bytes of information and ones and zeros and out pops a dick pic, you know? It's like, <laughs> it's like I, I get it. But then when you say this stuff, I'm like, okay, I can see how that makes sense. And it still sounds crazy to me. Is that because like, the pharmaceutical industry has preconditioned my mind to think that what you're saying is crazy or is this because this is like what's old is new again like it makes sense and it doesn't make sense at such a deep level that I'm having like a schizophrenic break in my mind right now yeah well I remember do you know who Greg Braden is no uh so Greg Braden is a probably another hippie uh, that like I've never heard yeah, of he's, right he's a to he's a total hippie but he was talking about he went to a shaman that was doing a a uh, rain dance and he was really excited because he thought it was going to be this whole, you know, production and he was going to get to see this whole rain dance. And he said that the guy drove, got him in his truck and he was like, oh, OK, we're going in a truck. So he drove up to the top of the mountain. He got out. And he was like, come over to the side of the mountain. And he just bowed his head for a few seconds. And then he lifted up and he's like, all right, we're done. And he was like, wait, that's it? <laughs> he was like, that's all there is? And he said a few minutes later, it literally started raining. And so he was just like, did this guy like refine this process over 20, 30 years? And this is just what it takes now. And I think like the reason why I'm bringing that up is to say like, isn't it funny? Like whenever we go into something new, like diets, we do 75 diets. And then ultimately we end up coming back to the most minimalist, like easiest thing that we, we were like, surely that can't be it. Like that can't be something that helps me. But right. we explore everything, and then we come back to the most minimalistic, easiest choice anyways, and we're like, why didn't we do this from the beginning, right? <laughs> it's like, right. So I think, like, for me, when you really look at some of the studies that are starting to come out with sound, where there was a woman that was showing that uh, uh, penicillin has a frequency, just like anything. Like, foods have frequencies, essential oils. Like, everything has a frequency that it vibrates at. Everything in this perceived reality has a vibration of lighter sound, right? Um, and so she showed that they gave penicillin to the first group of people and watched how it reacted with the bodies, you know, for the different things they were going through. And the second set had the same ailments, but they played frequency music into the, the person just through headphones. And they started seeing that the body reacted very similar to the people that took the penicillin. Now, is that placebo? Or is it actually the frequency interacting with the person? And so what I always try to tell people is that, you know, John, Jonathan Goldman is one of probably the largest sound healers in the world right now. And he said, intention plus frequency or sound equals healing. And so it's like, it's, it's almost like taking your mindset and deciding something and then you're writing that vibration, that wave. I always tell people frequency is the great disruptor. So if someone's having something going on in their body like pain and then they feel this bass low frequency come into their body and they feel this vibration, they're like, oh, what is this? And, you know, they, they're like, oh, it must be working because I can feel it. Right. And so they, their mind gets behind this where the frequency is working. It is helping them. They're basically you're taking something that's out of alignment, out of vibrational alignment, and you're playing a vibration that is in the, the healing frequency of a normal functioning liver. And then this liver is starting to be entrained. It's an entrainment that takes place where it heal, it hears that frequency vibrationally feeling it. And then it's like, oh, that's where I'm supposed to be. You know what I'm saying? It's like your friend saying, hey, man, you're complaining too much. Like, come down here. Sit with me. Let's take some breaths. Like, there's a beautiful thing out there called life. You know, you can unplug from the TV and, and the news. And, like, let's go outside and sit in nature and give each other hugs and hug some trees, right? <laughs> Right. So it's like, yeah, yeah. So I feel like it's it's literally something that is hard for people, but it's so minimal and the understanding of why and how this works. We're made up of water, you know, mostly made up of water. And water is one of the highest, fastest um, transfer rates of sound, you know, like dolphins, whales, the, the, the amount of speed that sound travels through water is like it's, you know, almost it's super fast. So it's like basically... What you're dealing with is someone who is solely made up of water, sound and frequency highly affect that, and you're helping them to remember the natural vibrational state of like a healthy liver, health, healthy lungs, healthy intestinal frequency, 
Um, and then by listening to that, it's helping to raise the bar or to do an entrainment where it's saying, okay, I get it. It's that friend, you know, coming in and saying, hey. Okay, so I, I have no idea if music vibrations cure liver problems, but let me let me make maybe <laughs> a, a, a corollary or an analogy or something. Uh, I, do a, I have a coaching program for loan officers and we do a 10 minute call every morning. Um, as often as possible, unless I'm doing the Zoom from my car or something, I always try to play music before the lead generation call because I know in my heart of hearts, music puts people in a different state and it's a good pattern interrupt. And no matter how stressed out they are about the appraisal or the realtor that's yelling at them or rates going up, it's like, if I can get them on Zoom and if I can play a music video, it's usually like, you know, Guns N' Roses, Pearl Jam, 80s, One Hit Wonders, whatever. If I can give them a little bit of a like transformative state for three minutes, they're so much more prepared to hear the message, which is the 10 minute coaching call. I know that to be true, period, end of story. I've had one person out of hundreds and hundreds of people that I've coached that has complained, well, why do you play music before your coaching call? I'm like, well, you're a hateful person. I'm firing you from coaching. And everybody else, like, <laughs> I swear, I've got like 30 coaching members that stay in the coaching just because like every morning they want to hear like the track of the day from Scott Groves. Um, yeah. So I know that to be true. So I guess my question would be, could I take like you two's The Joshua Tree, um, you could remix it for me in a 528 hertz love language frequency music and like yeah. I would be more loving listening to The Joshua Tree at that hertz or is it how the music is made or can it be remastered or how did like, can we take the Rocky soundtrack and make it into like a really hardcore, it's going to cure my liver? Yeah. <laughs> Well, there's a lot of debates around this. I am from the school of thought that you have to record the instruments and the in the tuning from the beginning. What you're talking about is you'd be pitch shifting the music into a different frequency. Yeah. Um, and it does change it a little bit, but it's also I don't I don't feel like it's the same because the instruments weren't recorded in the original frequency of that music. So um, like, for instance, just to give you an idea, I call the music that we make for meditation, it's more tonal based music, right? And so people are like, what does that mean? And I said, well, there is melody, but the melody is there in sprinkles. And I said, these tones are generated in such a way that the stereo mix and the binaural beats are used as a carrier frequency. And then we're delivering a mono beat to you know the the center so a lot of people will listen right here and they'll say oh i feel music like right here like when i'm listening with headphones right and so um they'll say your music sounds a lot more full than regular music that i listen to and i said well it's because we lay a foundation of tones first and then those tones go from the beginning of the song to the end of the song and what that's doing is it's giving your brain something and your heart something to synchronize to right? So it's like a synchronization that takes place with the heart and brain where it actually lowers the heart rate, lowers the brainwave activity into a more relaxed state. And then the person starts doing the thing where they're doing the, the head bob, you know, they, they start like where they're zoning out, falling right. asleep. And they're like, I just don't understand how this works. And I'm like, basically, it's in training your heart and your brain to step down. And it's saying like, it's safe here. And I said, it's if you listen to like a white noise machine before you go to sleep. It's the same type of idea. Right. But what we wanted to do was create something that was a little more artsy and a little more melodic than just a white noise. We wanted right. to create something that engaged the listener, but still gave those same types of feelings of like sleepiness and like kind of zoning out, kind of toning down the heart and brain so that they could be more relaxed. Dude, instead of like listening to smile, you should have named the company fancy white I, I like that a little bit more. I'm going to be honest. Uh, so, uh, you know, like so much of this rings true with me because have you ever met anybody, even a horrible dancer like myself who gets off the dance floor feeling worse about themselves? Like nobody in the history of the world has gone onto a dance floor, listened to music, allowed themselves to get into the beat of the music, move their body physically, and come off the dance floor and be like, man, I wish I hadn't done that. It's, it just doesn't happen, right? Like there's something in the frequency of music that's like uplifting. So I guess it makes sense to me that there would be some healing uh, potential in that same music, but... I don't know. My brain's just having a hard time with the bridge that far. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read a bunch about this, and then I'm gonna have you back on. But um, okay. Again, going back to like, I'm a creator. I bring you a couple hours worth of albums. I don't even know if we answered that question. Like, how would we have a business relationship? 
Yeah. So basically we would teach you how to record in sacred frequency and then give you kind of a template of what we've done to build our business model out and give you ideas and kind of coach you in the brand in building your brand and then give you some ideas in your area, like yoga studios, holistic centers, working with meetup groups and different community group organizations, working with churches like the Unity Church. You know, Unity Church is very open-minded. They have a lot of meditation groups already. So it's like if you can already insert yourself into these areas, it's already going to help you start growing your community. And like where you can add value in someone else's community is really big to get started where you're not starting from scratch and, and yeah. trying to create a community. So, um, and, and we're really cautious. Like we tell people like, it's not just about gaining, uh, you know, the people's followers from these communities. It's like really inserting yourself to attend events with these communities and to become a part of the community and really offer a value to that community that may not be you know, offered at this point in time. And then also creating things where you're bringing people to those groups, they're bringing people to your groups and creating a real synergistic exchange. So it's like, it's something that we're trying to do with, a, you know, it's, it's business, but it's with heart, you know, so, it's trying to really. So you're coaching the musician, but then does listening to smile, do you guys like, you know, handle the packaging and the distribution and like I would host my music on your service or are those, you know, 700 songs or albums, I can't remember what you said, are those all your creation that you currently have on the site? Yeah, most of them are my creation, but every month we have a featured musician or artist. Um, Brittany was actually a, a, a piano, you know, played some piano and did some voice on some of our stuff before. And there's a lot of affiliates around the world who are musicians themselves and have contributed either voice or instruments onto tracks. And what's really neat about that is then they're able to say, Hey, this company that's doing these things in nine different countries, I was a part of this album. Now they're able to bring this album to their community that they're a part of. And a lot of the affiliates have the opportunity. Like we do open calls, like asking for musicians, like we want some musicians for this coming year. Do you know someone? Are you guys interested? And then asking them things like, you know, what kind of songs are you wanting to hear? And it's really interesting, the feedback we get. Like one woman from Australia is like, you guys don't have any jazz music. And I was like, jazz sound healing. I was like, okay, well, yeah, let's do it. Like, so yeah. It's like, yeah. So it's just, there's a lot of interesting feedback and the community is able to help sculpt and mold some of, you know, the direction that we're going through these surveys that we do with our affiliates. So, so how are you making money? Are like, I, you know, I've looked at your website prior to this call and it's like, you have some membership, you have some personal use. Is it like, Hey, I, I'm a, I'm the owner of a yoga studio and I want to have a catalog of great background music. So I'll pay you $59 a month and I can stream your music. Or is it like, am I buying the content? Is there a licensing thing? Like how, how are you making money and how would I interact with you if I wanted to give you money? Yeah. So, um, the affiliate program is a membership slash affiliate program. The affiliate program is basically having the proper permissions and license to use our music in a commercial setting. Um, that's issued from us directly as the owners of the music hundred percent. And then basically we do this private, uh, license with the, uh, practitioners where not only are they able to utilize it in their settings, they're able to use it with, you know, uh, uh, solo coaching, coaching, uh, calls and in persons, they're able to do retreats, you know, events, all of that. But then they also, we teach them how to host online meditations where they can drive ticket prices and create new interactions with potential clients. Um, and you know, through those monthly exchanges, and then, um, also they can host in-person events where they can make tickets. They can also resell the music at these events. You know, if someone's like, Oh, I really like the music today and yoga class, you know, okay. If you buy the album, you using our code. It also gives us money, supports the, the studio. Um, and then you get to use the music at home. And so all of that is a part of the program. And then they also have the ability to white label to create their own branded, like guided meditation, coaching albums that are using the frequency. So a lot of like hypnotherapists, life coaches, neuroscientists are using this. And the reason that's really neat is a lot of hypnotherapists know brainwave states, but when you get into frequencies of music that they're using, they almost always know nothing about this because it's not their forte. So like what we're saying is, hey, we will come alongside you and this is what we have put all of our time and effort and study, you know, years and years in this field. And so we also have been working with clients all over the world and here's some of the feedback we've got. And so we're sharing that data with them, but then we're also helping them to be more transparent with their own clients and 
and can share a little bit deeper about the process of interacting with the music. And so it's like two fortes coming together, peanut butter and jelly, delivering something that is um, not really currently in that market. And so um, a lot of this is in that, you know, that direction. We're, we're starting to license our music to sound bed, you know, companies and sound machine companies. We're getting into product infusions with like, you know, um, food and, and even like meditation sprays that have the frequency in that as well. And so it's just something that uh, what we're doing is creating a network of affiliates that are able to not only have products to offer their community, but they're also able to have pretty much a complete uh, multi-use license in that area where they can create multiple revenue streams from the music. And so that's one of the things that we like to have communication about is everyone in a commercial setting has to have music licensing to play music in a commercial space. If you're not, you're breaking copyright law. Um, One of the women came up to us at an event. We were at Carnegie Mellon University and working at University of Pittsburgh Medical Center doing some events, continuing education classes with doctors and nurses and the woman approached us after the event and she said can you look at this lawsuit and so we opened it and i was like man one hundred fifty-five thousand dollars. she's being sued she had six yoga studios 55 teachers and they were using spotify playlists in their class and all the teachers were using it so she was getting sued and she said i don't understand i pay the ten dollars a month and i said well you pay ten dollars a month for you and your household or in your car it's not for commercial use and 55 teachers using it definitely you know and that's why you're being sued and so she's like well i still don't understand and i said well okay if i took a yoga class from you video and i put my music to it and uploaded it to my youtube channel and it got two million views because you're a beautiful woman you have a great personality you're very personable you have a good flow and people think that you're very knowledgeable in what you're doing you're engaging to people and so i'm utilizing that to get more streams on my music and i said wouldn't that make you really upset she was like yeah and i said okay so that's how we feel when you use our music (laughs) right right it's like you're like but i paid the 30 dollars for your one yoga class why don't i get to use it in perpetuity forever (laughs) Yeah. So, so basically um, I think it's just something that a lot of people don't understand, but when they see what we're trying to do, we're saying, we're not going to get nitpicky. We know there's people using music, but we want to create something that you can support us in the creation of this music. And we want to support you and being able to create multiple revenue streams and protect yourself from being sued, you know, from any of those industry people. Yeah. I, I'm uh, I don't want to mention them by name, but I'm thinking of a very popular, um, very popular high end gym ecosystem where their whole thing is built off of music rhythm to the workout. And we'll talk about it when we get off uh, when we get off the the live stream here, uh, or we're done recording. Yeah. But um, you know that's their whole business model, and I know for a fact. Every single one of their instructors just uses either iTunes or Spotify. So they're releasing yeah. playlists in a, you know, and it's a curated playlist by the instructor, but they're they're using, you know, what's supposed to be $10 a month for their personal use in a setting of 60 or 70 gym um, uh, attendees. And I mean, they have to be ripe for a giant lawsuit um, yeah. because, you know, this this franchise has, you know, 80 or 100 franchises across the, the nation. It's like, oh, man, what a what a mess they're they're putting themselves in. Yeah, the the uh, the biking, the cycle, uh, I'm not going to name it either, but the cycle company, you know, they yeah. just got hit with a huge lawsuit about the music that they were using on their machines. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's something that's happening more and more. And people are like, oh, I'm safe. And I'm like, you're not because the music industry is not making money. So they're going to where they can find it, which is sticking yeah. to you guys, <laughs> you know, which makes sense, their money. which, which yeah. totally makes sense. Because if I walked into, you know, ABC spin studio with Chris and a camera set up in a recording studio, and I was like, no, 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 I paid $50 for this class, but I'm going to record it. And then this is going to be my lesson that I go home and do on my Peloton. You're like, oh, well, well, uh, no, that's not how it works. Like you need to be here in person paying for each individual class. And it's like, well, you're doing yeah. the same thing with music. Um, and, and I, and I totally get it. You know, I wanted to, uh, touch on this. You mentioned the corporate accounts that you guys are signing up with and whatnot. And I, I get it like subconsciously. Okay. Happy employees, better productivity, da, 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 da. Like I kind of get the pitch, but in the current market where like money's getting harder to come by, inflation, interest rates are up, companies are like, you know, tightening their belts and, and, and cutting costs. 
how do you explain to, let's say you go to ABC Mortgage Company and you're like, you know, you got a lot of employees working from home. You got a lot of people that are just coming out of three years of massive amounts of stress. It was like two years, the busiest the mortgage business has ever been. And then this year, everybody's just eating dog doo-doo because rates are up and prices are a mess and whatnot. Um, and we can play this music and your client, your, your employees will be in a better mood. They'll have better interactions. They'll respond to more emails per hour. Like how can you guys actually measure the ROI of a company that pays you, I'm just gonna throw a number out there, $20,000 for your playlist, you know, uh, hey, we're gonna take a break every 20 minutes for 10 deep breaths and you're gonna have this this music playing in the background that's gonna soothe your soul and frequency you to a more intelligent underwriter. Like, how in the hell do you quantify that? <laughs> yeah, so, well, the first thing is the guy that is in charge of our workplace wellness program has 27 years experience um, in the workplace, you know, uh, workplace wellness space. And so one of the things that we developed in this program is we go in and we say, what are your top three, you know, um, on your insurance, what are the top three claims that you're working with? You know, so we look, every company is different. So you're basically customizing a program for each company right? and you're going in and you're saying, give us a year, let's show that we can lower these numbers by 10, 15% in all of these three categories. Let's make these the, fo the focus targets that we're going for. And if we can show that we're lowering these claims, that is saving you money every year. And also um, the head of our program has a lot of tricks up his sleeve, I would, I would just say, as far as like getting money from insurance, because insurance wants you to lower your claims. So right. they're not paying out all these claims. So there's a lot of companies that actually have money that is available for you to invest in these types of programs that will almost pay for these uh, programs that we're offering to these companies. So there's, yeah. there's insurance that can be, uh, you know, uh, programs that are available that they can take advantage of. There's also the, you know, the return on investment is lowering the claims, lowering the insurance costs that they're paying out every year, and then showing like, hey, this is actually helping our employees. And so the app that we have will also track the the interactions. And so there's also like a survey that the employees fill out. Like when you came in today, what is your pain level? Seven or a 10, you know, where are you at? And then afterwards they're asked the same questions. Where are you at now after this event? And so there's also companies that are doing things like heart rate monitors and different things like that to get more, you know, analytics, you know, pulled in for, you know, um, and being able to track data points better. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's basically, um, something that is totally non woo woo. It's something that you can actually see the changes, you know, in the employees and the claims dropping and, and, uh, and also just the testimonials that we get, you know, we really encourage people to really give, to incentivize these programs, you know, and that's one of the biggest things is that you have something that's a physical, tangible product that they can hold meditation sprays and different, you know, aromatherapies and things like that. So there's something there for them tangible. And then you have these in-person events that we train their employees to host and do once or twice a month where they're engaging. And then we also really um, are working with the companies to incentivize, you know, hey, if you have two events a month and then you have them listening to the music at their workstation and they complete this each month, you know, let's give them two hours off, you know, the last Friday of the month where the whole company gets out two hours early. And so we're seeing these incentives that the, where the companies are incentivizing these programs, there's a huge jumps in the people that are willing to try it. And then the people that are trying it about 75, 78% of the people are sticking with it where they're actually saying, Oh, this really does make a difference in the way I sleep. Or I made my biggest sale after lunch, after doing my mindfulness meditation, you know, and things like that. So it's just, it's really interesting, man. It's, it's, uh, I feel like, again, we come back to COVID happened and companies started looking at mental health and like, uh, you know, workplace wellness in a different way. Yeah. Um, you mentioned, you know, 528 Hertz is the like love beat. We need to find the lead generation Hertz because that's where, <laughs> that's where my passion is. I've written a book on lead generation. I'm always trying to get my coaching clients to lead generate and prospect. And I'm like, what's the, 
what's the frequency that's going to put people in a mood to like make warm calls? These aren't cold calls. I'm not asking people to sell encyclopedias or Bibles door to door. I'm like, dude, call people you've done business with before. Like get in the right frame of mind. Go for a walk if you have to, you know, shut off all the distractions and like just call the people who you know are potential referral sources. And the pushback I get from people to do the things that they know they need to do in their business is crazy. So I need like the, I need like the three minute, um, you know, uh, mindfulness, 479 hertz is going to put people in a lead generation mode. So if you can yeah. find that, I'll buy it from you. <laughs> okay. Well, we're actually working with a Wall Street, a, a, um, an executive that retired from Wall Street uh, when he was, I believe, 35 or 36. And one of yeah, the things so we're working F on- that guy, by the way. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm good for good for him. But F the way. it's like when I hear friends that are like, oh, yeah, we sold this like online tech company that sold bracelets on Instagram and we exited for uh, $27 million. And I'm like, yeah, I suck at life. Like, I'm just I'm, I'm a piece of shit. Anyway, I digress. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no. But basically, we're working with him coming up with like manifestation um, and he was like, what would you use to create someone? And like he, cause he, he knows I love the master key system. It's just like a huge thing for me. And I listen to it pretty much every night. Just, it's seven hours audio. You know, it's like a, it's a real intense listen, but, um, you know, he was like, if you were, Wait, you listen like to this, master- you hold on, hold on. You listen to the same seven hour audio every night when I go to sleep. Yeah. Shut the f- <laughs> You lay in bed for seven hours. <laughs> I, yeah, I listened to the audio for seven hours. All right, hold on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look this up. I'm going to try this tonight. Yeah. Is it on YouTube? Okay. Yeah, so go to YouTube and type in Master Key System Full, F-U-L-L, and you'll see a blue picture with like a door uh, on it, and it's uh, it's really powerful, man. It's intense. It's Seven hours wrote, and seven minutes. Yeah, and it was wrote in 1912. The master key system in 28 lessons. So you literally just like you're you have your subconscious working on this all night. You listen to this as you sleep. I'm guessing you fall asleep somewhere around chapter three. And then you just let you just let it play in the background. So your subconscious is like killing it. Yeah. So then I wake up in the morning. I listen to it for about 20 minutes and then I get up and I do my workout meditation. Holy shit, dude. You are like a superhero. Do you ever work or do you just like, do you just meditate <laughs> no, and, okay, you just meditate and <laughs> yeah, zen yeah. out and listen to books and then like money just manifests? No. So every month I have to create seven new songs. So I write, record, mix, and master seven songs every month and put them out to our community. And then I also do a lot of podcasting, probably, I don't know, somewhere around 70 to 100 podcasts a year, something like that. Dude, you're like, um, you're like, uh, doesn't Kiss have the record for like the most released albums? Because like they have all these different live albums and covers. Am I, am I, Chris? Can you look this up? I think Kiss has like the most released albums or something. And Eddie Vedder, like one of his goals was like, I have to do solo projects and live albums because I want to release more albums than Kiss in my career. I remember that was like one of his stated goals or something like that. So yeah, you're yeah. like, uh, you're like a mixture of Gene Simmons and Elvis Costello and uh, whoever wrote the Master Key System. Yeah, so November 44. 16th is 44 nice. albums by Kiss? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. You got to look up how many does Eddie Vedder have because I think his goal with like Pearl Jam and his private catalog and everything is he wanted to do more than Kiss. So we'll have to see if he beat him. I think, I think I'm going to give you guys two figures. You can look them up. I believe the most albums of all time is probably uh, Frank Zappa. Frank oh. Zappa and John Coltrane. Wow, I was going to go with Buckethead, that like bass player that like yeah, has released Buckethead. like like yeah, 90 Buckethead albums. Yeah, lot. Yeah, he's probably has a lot more actually now I think about it. Buckethead is a is a beast. He's pretty wild. Does anybody know There's, who he actually is or does he still play with that uh Kentucky fried chicken bucket on his head? As far as I know, he's got the mask in the bucket still. Oh my goodness. And for those that There's don't a, there I was just going to say this. Go ahead, go ahead. No, for those that don't know that we're talking about, just Google Buckethead and this guy, <laughs> um, uh, okay, I'm going to look it up. Number of albums by Buckethead. Um, Bucket- El- Elvis Presley made over 60 albums. Okay, Buckethead wow. has 348 studio albums. <laughs> See. And this guy plays with a Kentucky Fried Chicken bucket on his head. You can you can now see his face. But for the first like hundred solo albums, he just had a Kentucky Fried Chicken bucket over his face, and he would just just jam on the bass. And I, I he's got to have some record, right? Like like nobody's done three hundred forty eight studio albums. How crazy! No. Um, yeah, he puts out so much, man. Oh yeah, so so. November 16th will be seven years that I've released an album every single month. And so it's, uh, Oh, yeah, so you beat Buckethead. 
You got, uh, <laughs> how many albums do you have? Well, so I also have a wellness series and then I also have other side projects that I do too. So I have like seven or eight side projects that I don't really put out in public. I mean, I, they're under like pseudo names, but <laughs> the, the, uh, yeah. So, um, but yeah, I have with listening to smile, I think there's somewhere around 90 albums, I think something like that. All right. Well, you got, um, you got a ways to go to catch Buckethead, but Buckethead. Yeah. I got it. Maybe I'll do be, Teach, I'll, I'll teach Buckethead some sound healing and we can do a sound healing album together. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> this is amazing. Um, this is the best conversation oh, ever. I'm so glad we're doing it. Uh, what, what, it, what am I forgetting to ask about the music that you released, the business you're trying to um, create, the conspiracy over 442? I don't even know what the hell that means, but we talked about it before we went live. What, what, did, yeah. what did we forget to talk about? Well, I think that Literally, our company, you know, on our website, we say 10 minutes a day, um, you know, 10 to 20 minutes a day, depending on what you want to invest, you can create change, uh, you know, using our music. And it's basically just every day, 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes at night, you know, where you're in the first thing in the morning and right before you go to sleep, you're listening to this music and creating an intention, you know, while you're listening. And usually within two weeks, people are starting to see their sleep habits change. They're starting to see changes in the way that they're making better decisions with food. Um, they're seeing like they feel more relaxed, more joy. And so like when people see that and they go further, like using it like an hour or two a day. And what I mean by that is it's not just meditation or sleep. It's like we have upbeat, we have movement meditation, volume one and two. We have shamanic drumming. We have curtain music. We have yoga music. I mean, there's there's something for everything. We call it the soundtrack for release and healing is basically what our albums are. And um, I think it's just such a minimal investment. You know, if you're using it for personal use, you're talking $25 for an album, get you some headphones and then 10, 20 minutes a day and just see for yourself, you know, it's a challenge. Like, what are you experiencing? Where are you feeling it in your body? Are you seeing movement of stagnant energy? Are you seeing more joy or better sleep? And we love hearing from people like people sending in emails or video testimonials. It's just something we have a YouTube channel, you know, listening to smile. There's a bunch of uh, testimonials up from all over the world. People, you know, putting in their two cents about the music and listening to it. And so they're all unpaid, you know, testimonials. It's just people submitting those to us. And so, um, yeah, I, I think that basically just saying it's not a huge money commitment. It's not a huge time commitment. It's something that everyone can do. And, uh, you know, we're looking for new businesses to, that are innovative, that want to work with their employees to create a better, you know, cult company culture. And, um, yeah, so I think it's just getting the awareness out there that this is available. Well, I think the timing on this is perfect because obviously we're dropping the beginning of 2023. People have probably already broken their New Year's resolution. So if you're looking for, like, a wellness kick for the year or something for self-improvement, maybe it's this music, right? Maybe it's a subscription to your service, understanding things. Maybe it's watching the, the, the key, the master key system every night for seven <laughs> hours. I don't know. But I mean, this is giving people a lot to think about um, uh, going into 2023. And so I want to close on the two questions I always close on. Uh, well, for you, I've got to come up with three. Uh, the, number one is favorite movie and why? Uh, what are you most looking forward to in 2023? And then obviously for somebody like yourself, you know, favorite album that people might know. Obviously some obscure 1960s wannabe Coltrane, probably not going to be in people's radar, but you can still tell us. So let's go with favorite movie. What's the, uh, what's your favorite movie of all time and why? Oh man, that's a tough one. Uh, can I do two? Yeah, of course. You <laughs> okay, do. This, okay. this, this is our podcast. You can do whatever you want. Yeah, yeah. So Dark City <clears throat> is a movie that was made in 1998 with Keith Sutherland. So crazy, that movie. It's so nuts, man. It's, it's, a, it's wild. And uh, I just think it's really interesting, the whole thing about tuning. You know, it's like, like he can tune. <laughs> it's like the aliens, you know. Anyways, it's, it's a great movie. And then the other thing I was going to say is there's a documentary called Cool School. And it's about the art scene in Los Angeles. And it shows how this one gallery pretty much built the entire art scene of Los Angeles. They, one of the first shows they gave, uh, was before anyone knew who Andy Warhol was. They brought him out to California and showed the, showed the, uh, Campbell soup cans. 
And, yep. you know, it's wild. But basically, they show you how to build a community. And there's some amazing artists in the in the film. And it's just um, Jeff Bridges narrates it. It's called Cool School. And I it's love just it. a documentary about the art scene. It's, it's a beautiful documentary, man. So those are probably my two favorites. Uh, love it. Favorite album? Yeah. Like what could you album. what could you listen to start to finish? Oh man. Uh so there is a guy, an artist, I'm not sure where he's from, but he's called Clem C L E M Leak. Clem Leak. He's on Spotify. And there's an album that it's a it's like a uh, tan album with like a black symbol on it. I cannot remember the name of the album. Um, but I could literally listen. It's a guitar, it's a pretty much chill guitar album there's no there's no drums it's just guitar and maybe some voice here and there very relaxing i could listen to that non-stop i think i've been listening to it for years and years already. the name of the album is rest uh yes, from 2013 yes yeah it's really a great album probably one of my favorite guitar meditation albums of all time like it's really but if i was going to say something that's not in this field i probably would go with frank zappa or the doors man Oh. And the reason the reason I say that is because I really like unique artists that do groundbreaking stuff. And I think yeah. that you'll never hear someone in the history of the rest of the world say they sound like The Doors or they sound like Frank Zappa. They, they're so unique and so different. I just love, even if I don't like everything that they do, I love listening to the musical stylings of what, what they did, how it was recorded. It's just very unique, man. I like unique stuff. There, there is this thing where, like, with the Doors, I would say maybe a couple, a couple other bands that I'm really in love with: Creedence Clearwater Revival, uh, Led Zeppelin, The Beatles. You can hear a B, a B side track from one of their more obscure albums and be like, "Oh, that's the Doors." Like, yeah. you know, you don't have to know the song. You don't have to have heard it on 93.1 500 times. Um, and yeah. then last question, and I got to take a bio break, so you got to make it quick. Um, okay. What, what are you, what are you most looking forward to coming up uh, here in 2023? I'm ready for capitalizing on all this master key system work, man. Nice. <laughs> I'm going to spend no, I, seven hours tonight listening to the master key, and my <laughs> wife is going to be like, what in the hell are you doing? It's four in the morning. I'm like, bro, Ian told me. I got I got to be in tune with the master key system. And she's going to be like, oh, my God, are we gi- are you joining Scientology next, or what is going on here? Every time I have a podcast, I come back with some new idea. My wife's like, I don't even want to hear it, man. You've done 100 of these, and we have 100 new ideas. I just I can't do it anymore. <laughs> master key system i'm all in all right awesome awesome all right man well hey ian i i love you to death man this has been a great conversation i'm so glad that Brittany connected with us uh connected us and uh i, I want to talk to you like summer of 2023 2023 see how the business is going see how you're growing okay. and you know we'll try to get some eyes on your website and and some ears on your music for thanks for being on man thank you so much for having me man